Thank you, Cameron. Um, so this morning, RPA was mentioned by, um, by one of our earlier talks, um, and I'm going to present you some work we've been doing on, on RPA uh, for schismiasis, and mainly this work's been done by three students from the London School um, that come to do projects for me. Um, but I just want to point out that I'm from a, a molecular epidemiology background, um, looking at the biology of parasites as well. Um, I do a lot of field work as well, so I know what the limitations are in endemic field settings. And what I try to do is to try and think about molecular diagnostics and how we can overcome some of those limitations by new technologies as well. Just put in the life cycle schismiasis here, because I think it's very important to understand your parasites when you're thinking about diagnostics. Not every, there's not going to be a one-fit diagnostic for all diseases. You need to think about the pathogen, how they're transmitted. Through the life cycle schismiasis, I want to point out as well that um, what's, what's the kind of key priority for diagnostics? And for schismiasis, I think the real key is that um, sensitivity of a diagnostic. And it's really to do with this life cycle, though. You can have one infected person that can excrete um, a couple of eggs into a, um, into a water body. They can, those myricidae go into that snail and then they clonally replicate. And that causes a, 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 an outbreak then. So it's just one infected person. If you miss that infected person, then you're back to square one over a very short time period. Also with schismiasis, I like to think of schismiasis as two diseases. You have the intestinal form here, yeah, and then you also have the urinary form. Um, they're caused by different species, and when you're thinking about what samples you're testing, you need to acknowledge that they are different, different forms of a disease. So what samples you're going to test, what you're trying to target as well, um, and also kind of the morbidity associated with them. These pictures here are the, um, the symptoms that can be seen when you've got high worm burdens. You don't often see that um, in many places anymore, especially where we're getting down to very low levels of infection. So you don't see those clinical signs. And a lot of people feel well. They don't feel like they, have, they are infected. And now we're starting to see um, uh, people not wanting to take the drugs because they don't think they're infected. They don't, they don't see the necessity of that. So it's actually by showing somebody that they are infected and showing them that positive result to actually get them to take that treatment um, so we can start to um, actually start to move, towards, move further towards elimination. So many of you have seen, um, we've seen pictures of this this morning about how your diagnostics need to change as you change, as you go through your different uh, stages of your kind of control and elimination programs. And as you get down to the lower end, so the elimination, the transmission interruption, the post elimination <coughs> stage, you need to start to increase the sensitivity and specificity of your diagnostics. Um, and things like molecular diagnostics offer some of those characteristics. So we can start to think about integrating those diagnostics into those, that stage. So we have good diagnostics for schisto when we have high um, burden of disease, high numbers of egg, uh, worms laying eggs. Microscopy is very field friendly and it can be done and it, can, and it works very well when you have high levels of disease. And then as you move down the scale of the, um, of the control program, you can start to think about using other diagnostics. There's some, the antigen tests, which are, which are very promising, and Gobert will talk later about CAA, which is um, probably the most promising diagnostic coming, coming through now. And um, there's a lot of investment going into that now, um, looking at that antigen um, test. But there's still question marks again about those tests, about how good they are in the field, how high throughput they are, um, how robust they are. So just to point out that. Um, but the molecular diagnostics do offer that sensitivity and specificity, uh, especially at those, those last stages of a, of a control program. Um, we have qPCR and LAMP, which are the, which are the ones which are um, more readily used. Um, and molecular diagnostics offer some advantages in that you can look at mul multiple sample types uh, you can target uh, different species here as well, using different DNA targets. You can look for eggs, you can also look for cell-free parasite DNA in different kind of clinical samples. Um, there has been a few studies which have also taken swabs such as um, saliva and tested DNA in, in those kind of non-invasive samples. Um, so, and in urogenital schistomiasis, again, we can start to think about using diagnostics to diagnose other um, other. Uh, <coughs> Uh, pathological um, pathology of the disease, such as genital schistomiasis, uh, diagnosing uh, particularly female genital schistomiasis, which leads to infertility. So, looking at also those other clinical problems. 
So we can target different species, and that gives us high specificity of our, of our, of our diagnostics. We can do multiple, um, multiple assays. Um, we can um, try and target different, different DNA regions to increase specificity and also sensitivity, um, looking at different um, geno geno genome regions. And we've got a lot of work now going on on genomics and actually looking at uh, those genome regions and actually using better D G DNA regions to get higher sensitivity and specificity. And those assays can be quantitative, so you can start to think about uh, quantifying your burden of disease. So qPCR and LAMP have, uh, have been developed, um, but there are limitations. They're often very technical. You need infrastructure and resources. Um, one of the big hurdles is the sample preparation, assay running time, um, and actually how to interpret that, that data. So the point of care characteristics is not often met. Also, the cost is high, um, and this is really um, stopping their use in control programs. So when we think of molecular diagnostics, there's three key steps in the development of a molecular diagnostic test. You have to have your DNA isolation, sample preparation step. Then you have to target the DNA and replicate it so you can actually detect it. And then you've got the third step, which is actually that detection of the DNA. We need to think about multiple things at those different stages. You need to think about how long does that sample prep take? How, what's the purity of the DNA that you need to have? Uh, what equipment you need, what sample you're using, how, how is that sample being preserved, or is it going to be stuck in a car for um, several hours or several days be before it gets to an area where it can be um, extracted, what's the throughput and cost. Again, with the amplification, how long is it going to take? Is that you're going to be able to diagnose that pa patient straight in front of you, as we heard earlier, that's, that's a very important thing before that patient actually leaves and you lose them. Ses sensitivity, specificity, any inhibitors in your, in your sample, Again, equipment, uh, throughput and cost. And then again, at that detection stage, you've also got those criteria there which you have to start to think about. So qPCR and PCR um, is often uh, taken forward now as described as the gold standard. Um, and it can be sensitive and specific. But as I said, it needs that equipment, that infrastructure and that ability. Um, and it's because it needs these high, high and variable temperatures. So you need labs and you need freezers. Um, we heard just now about Ebola and it looks like there's some really good steps forward now to actually reducing kind of that infrastructure that is needed. Um, but WHO wants the assured criteria for um, point of care diagnostics. So it's trying to build in these criteria into, into the diagnostics that we take forward here. So um, isothermal assays uh, do overcome some of those limitations of of those molecular diagnostics that need those higher temperatures. And they can start to be, think, be thought about at the use of point of care or point of need of diagnosis. So this table just really shows you some of those, those criteria that we're thinking about. Um, the incubation time of those assays, um, the application, can they be multiplexed, how long does it take? And RPA is up here, it's, uh, it needs a very low temperature for working. Um, it takes very, it's, it's very quick time, um, and it can be, uh, it can run just in 10 minutes, um, and it can be, di uh, can, you can do DNA detection using multiple um, systems. And so RPA has been developed for multiple pathogens, this is the whole list here, and hit in red is actually the, um, just highlighting the NTDs that it has been developed for. And I think it's usually just through costs and logistics of actually why some of these haven't actually been taken forward. Um, have been actually taken uh, commercially, moved forward commercially. So RPA, just to give you a better background on it, it's, um, it's highly sensitive because it really needs only very few copies of DNA to actually target. Very rapid. Um, it, loads, it uses very low reaction temperatures. It can be run in battery powered devices, which are highly portable. The, um, the actual formulation is a dried formulation. It's lyophilized and it can be transported. It's stable at uh, various temperatures. Um, and it's also robust to inhibitors, so not like QPCR, which, is, um, which can be uh, um, inhibited by particularly things in stool samples, um, which can cause lots of problems. So this is um, a mobile suitcase, which was um, developed by Dr. Ahmed. Well, how did, um, in, from Germany, and he's developed these suitcases to take out into the field to do um, point of care test to treat scenarios. Um, and he's developed this for multiple pathogens, 
um, and taken them to various countries and he's, he's, he's got them to work very, very well. So when we think about those different stages we need for RPA, think about our sample preparation um, and what can we get away with. Can we start to use very crude DNA preparations for RPA? And there are some crude preparations on the market here. This is one just from Fiogen, which is an street, uh, um, a uh, speed extract kit. There's others available, and this is just taking clinical samples, heating them up, um, using a, a portable incubator there, and then doing this magnetic bead extraction. And you can do multiple samples uh, here, for, and it takes about 15 minutes. Then for the acid development, you're thinking about which target to, to go for. You design your primers and probes, and then you test your reaction conditions to see how fast you can get the reaction to, to run and how low you can get those reactions to run as well. And you've got those portable reagents to do that. So this is um, just showing you those portable reagents. They come in strips and uh, they're dry pellets. You can get your primers and probes incorporated into that pellet so you can have minimal steps of actually at, um, adding your buffers and your, and your um, other, and the DNA target as well. DNA detection, there's two kinds of systems there for DNA detection. There's one known as the EXO, which is the fluorescence-based detection, and then there's the NFO, which is also a lateral flow bit DNA um, detection system. So you, there's multiple um, small portable devices that can do that, uh, that fluorescence detection there. Um, and there's many more coming on the market now, and they're, they're very reasonable prices. Um, and some of them weigh um, just two kilograms, and you can take them um, just in, just in your um, carry-on bag, and you can uh, take them out of the field there. So we've developed a, um, a RPA assay for hematobium, um, which causes urogenesis And this is really thinking about targeting those eggs in those urine samples, or um, that free DNA there. We based our assay on a, a highly repetitive uh, repeat in the hematobium genome, known as the DRA1 repeat. And we tested this using the lateral flow system, um, and we got very good, nice results from this. So amplifying um, within 20 minutes, and then doing the lateral flow assay, um, and producing positive for hematobium DNA. Got it down to a low sensitivity of 100 femtograms of DNA, which is just not as low as I'd like it to be. For the lateral, but this is what we got for the lateral flow system. But I think with more optimization, we can get a much more high sensitivity there. Reaction times and temperature, um, it works as low as 30 degrees, and it takes, um, you can get a result within five to 10 minutes. We, we, with this assay, we started to put in inhibitors into our assays, and here we just put in crude urine to see how um, the reaction was affected. And it was, uh, it was, um, it performed very well with um, small amounts of urine, of crude urine put into these assays, showing so that how robust these samples are with them, with the crude samples and uh, putting in those inhibitors there. We then moved this assay on to develop it into a fluorescence, the fluorescence-based uh, system, which I prefer actually because it's, um, it cuts out that risk of contamination. Um, with the lateral flow system, you actually have to open those tubes and that gives you that risk of contamination then when you've got those amplicons. This is a closed system where you never actually open those tubes again. And we got good results and we got much more high sensitivity with this assay, getting down to 0.01 femtograms of DNA. We th then moved this out into the field and we went, um, there's a very... Um, there's a, there's a very good um, resource now in Pemba and Zanzibar, and one of, um, both the islands in Zanzibar. We've been collecting urine samples um, as part of an uh, elimination program in Zanzibar, <coughs> collecting urine samples over five years, um, thousands of urine samples there stored in freezers. And this gives us a great biorepository or resource to actually start to test and validate some of these, uh, these urine samples. So on Pember Island, this is a bit of a very small pilot study. We took 20 urine samples, did the crude extract out in the field, run the fluorescence-based detection system, and we had very nice results. We were getting, um, we could detect our DNA within six minutes, and we got very nice results. Um, we started then looking at different egg counts. Um, when we got very high egg counts, as you would expect, we got very nice results. When we start to get down to those lower egg counts, it starts to get a little bit, um, a uh, bit more difficult to actually um, determine um, what your true positive as well. So a lot more work there doing on looking at those really low prevalences and egg counts there. And that's where we really need this assay to work, is that when we got either zero eggs, because um, 
there's just no egg production, or we've got very low levels of eggs. So that's the urinogenital smile. I just want to show you that we've also looked at the um, system of manzanite in the intestinal form as well. And this is more tricky, um, and it's that because we're dealing with stool samples here, they're much more difficult to get DNA out of, a lot more logistics involved in there. But we've developed an assay based on d uh, two DNA targets, um, and we've started to run, we ran these in our portable machines. And again, we were using just the lateral flow system for, for this. And again, we can get very nice results. We can get assays running at 30 degrees within eight minutes of, uh, of uh, actually running the assay and down to 10 picograms of DNA. So promise there as well, we meant to um, but a lot, lot more work to do there. So RPA really has um, great potential for point of care diagnostics. It's highly sensitive, reactions are very quick, and can be run in portable devices with, with standard inhibitors. You can use very crude DNA preparations. It's simple and it's field friendly, um, very minimal um, steps needed for actually setting up the assay and running them. But again, lots more of our um, uh, development needed. Um, we need to validate and we need to test this, this system in multiple places and on different kind of samples and clinical samples. Um, I, I struggle with knowing what my gold standard is for schismiasis and what I should be basing all my results on. Um, we need to think about what kind of sample we're using and what, how those samples need to be preserved. Um, we need to determine what our sensitivity limits are, particularly in the clinical setting. We also need to think about what we're targeting. Are we targeting those eggs? Are we targeting those, that cell-free parasite DNA? And what's the dynamic of that between a past infection versus an active infection and infections after treatment as well? So still lots of questions there. But with um, the kind of new genomics, we think we can start to develop better assays um, and much more sensitive and specific assays. So I'd really like to see this, this test taken out into certain settings particularly in places like Zanzibar, where we're really going down to those elimination kind of uh, uh, criteria, where we can go into the field, we can take people like this, this, this man here, who's probably not going forward and getting treated or getting diagnosed and testing him there and then, except telling him that he's infected and that he risks actually infecting the whole of his community, the community and doing those test and treat scenarios. So just to finish, just to show you um, that it's probably a great promise here, um, I just want to point out again that it's that one person that uh, can infect the whole community again. So any false negatives can really create that great risk of rapid reinsertions, particularly of schistosomiasis. Um, and this point of need uh, testing will deliver treatment rapidly um, and to try and overcome those, uh, those scenarios where we've got non-compliance of uh, drug tainting and to develop those test and treat scenarios. And last slide, I just want to show you, this is, uh, I think it's been brought up many times this morning, about how long it takes to go from an idea right through to, to a clinical or commercial available test. And we need to really start thinking now about what's happening in the future, um, when we start to think about where we are going to be in 10, what we need for actually validating elimination or moving forward there. And just thank you to the collaborators, particularly my three students from the London School, and some of the funding there as well for those studies.